Hey everybody, how are you guys doing? I'm Eric Erlock, and this is another talk on logic, Greek philosophy, and Aristotle's logical work, the Organon, and specifically his fallacies found in his sophistical refutations and other works. So in his sophistical refutations, please see my other previous talks on Aristotle's logic and Aristotle. Aristotle lists fallacies, problems that are common errors in argument beyond mistakes made in chaining syllogisms and forms together, much as Gautama does in the Nyaya Sutra. The fallacy of equivocation is the first one he considers, confusing a word that means one thing with meaning another. It is odd to think, why don't we have language that only uses one word for one thing? We are highly contextual beings. I think that's the best Wittgensteinian thing to suggest, and I do like my Wittgenstein beyond Aristotle as far as logic and his later work. So, the why would we have words that can be confusing? Well, why not be a species that doesn't? Well, because we understand very much words in context in situations and so we can use words that have completely different meanings in other situations and we have never felt the need to completely iron out language and only have one sound stand for one thing language would be a lot simpler and we can imagine ourselves being organisms animals what have you that would find that very important we already would find it somewhat important but no one's ever really tried that and in fact this creates constant humor and humorous situations. This is uh, Aristotle's fallacies, again, are wonderful for the work of Lewis Carroll. I'm going to be doing a lot more talks on that because Lewis Carroll loves to play with language and show that things can be understood in more than one way, which is why you should mean what you say and say what you mean both for Lewis Carroll going both ways. I'll talk more about that when the time comes. So equivocation equivocating is conf uh, confusing one meaning of a thing or a word with another. Technically, Aristotle is only talking about a single word here specifically. Many today use the classic, there was an older uh, black and white classic at the movies. The moving pictures, as my great-grandmother used to call them. Uh, who's on first? That's who's on first. Well, yeah, because the guy's name is who, and so who is on first, and the guy would say yes. He's like, no, I mean who? That though, if the name of someone is who, then if you say, well, who did this? It's like, well, no, he didn't. Somebody else did. And that would be using the word who as uh, the who's down in Whoville and as a name and as a placeholding word, which could mean any sort of person, not a specific one. And that would be playing with different sorts of context, of course, as we would call it. So... The fallacy of amphibology is confusing a sentence that means one thing with meaning another, like equivocation, but for whole statements. Now, these are confusingly similar, and in fact, we could just conflate these and call it equivocation. And in fact, it's my understanding, I have not heard many people mention the word amphibology. Sounds like the study of amphibians, but I'm sure it isn't. So, equivocation, you can equivocate on a word or a phrase, and misunderstand a word or a phrase, and I'm not familiar with people using the word amphibology much. So it seems to me that we just say equivocate or something like that, and we actually use the word equivocate to mean more than one thing itself. And so here, you, uh, we would also say someone is just misunderstanding. Um, but the fallacy of equivocation, uh, when it is equivocation about a whole statement, uh, the folks who translate Aristotle call this, and Aristotle clearly called it something else, uh, the fallacy of amphibology. So if I say you can have one car or another and you wrongly interpret my or to be inclusive, I have done a lot about inclusive and exclusive or the buffet versus buying a car. I mention that a lot. I love that because or is understood in two confusingly interrelated ways, as you can have anything, more than one, and all of it, the whole smorgasbord, or you only get to have one car, why would you have more than one? We don't have the resources. And again, if we're on a safari, somebody says, well, maybe we have the budget for two cars, and nobody said that we strictly did or didn't. Uh, what did or mean right there or not is a wonderful Wittgensteinian problem. What I do believe Wittgenstein would say, and it's easy enough to say here, when we say or, we may or may not close it up, and we can understand it more openly or closedly, and that gets wonderfully elastic, as Wittgenstein would say. But... If I say, hey, you can have A or B or C at the car dealership, and you say, I will have one of A and one of B, please, 
I would say you misunderstood me, and in a certain sense, that is the fallacy of equivocation. Of course, here, notice, did you commit the fallacy of a equivocation about the word or, or did you commit the fallacy of amphibology about the whole phrase, including the word or? Well, kind of both, right? Depending on how you slice it. So, uh, and especially if there were other examples and you were committing a larger error in more than in more than one example, then that would actually very much frame for us which one you did in terms of others. Notice that equivocation and amphibology, like phrasing, framing the word in the sentence and the context. So equivocation and amphibology are making mistakes that we make in interpreting others, but also in interpreting ourselves such that we are changing the thesis, as the Niaya would say. Be careful, and I just did a talk about Derrida versus John Searle. Be careful about saying, well, if I declare or to be or, I know entirely and fully what I mean. Because John Searle said he liked Wittgenstein. Uh, I'm not sure if he still does. But Wittgenstein would certainly say it does not simply occur objectively and entirely to the utterer of the, of the utterance. Entirely what they mean by or, in a certain sense, Wittgenstein would leave it at the user feels comfortable using or that way and may not be thinking all of their own possibilities they are enacting out, which is unfortunately the human condition, how we find ourselves not plotting out every last meaning of the word horse as we use it. It is very weird to suggest we do or that we have everything bare and base apparent to ourselves. Derrida likes playing with how we're only aware of one thing or another in time, being very Heideggerian for a French guy. And so we all have to think, well, or could mean A, or B, or C. We can't s like all at once and just be aware of three things at once. It's just strange to suggest that we have total awareness of how we use the word or rather than slow down and pay attention to ourselves. But this obviously gets into how much do we intentionally say things when we say them and mean them, which is a strange, weird problem. Yes, and it gets, again, into the weeds here. This is all appropriate to bring up because we are talking about whether or not the individual understands how they make mistakes in context, and here one can ask, how much do we understand our context or our situation? Do we are not we don't have eyes on all sides of our head? Many have noted that we hear sentences quite differently based on which word is accented. Uh, the fallacy of accent seems to be a sort of amphibology. Aristotle, as with this other stuff, wants to categorical thought, but he actually, in much of the work of Aristotle, leaves things ambiguously overlapping in a lot of ways and does not fully cut his categories apart. This can be noticed in the work of Aristotle. He does not make categorical demands in ethics, rather balance, baby bear theory. But in logic, he seems to think we ascribe more to what is above the lunar sphere in, in so far as we can put A completely inside of B and B completely inside or not of C, such that we're better than skeptics, plants, and dogs, as he says, with our logic and reasoning. Many have noted that we hear sentences differently. We can see if we say, and somebody po uh, somebody else's example that they put on, uh, I think, Reddit online. It says, I, I think that she should have got the job. I think she should have gotten the job. Let me put it that way, whether or not that's uh, better or worse. So I think she should have gotten the job. Somebody went uh, accented with capital letters each word. Hey, buddy. Each word in the phrase. And it says, I, th I think that she should have got, g got the job. I think she should have gotten the job. I think, I think that she should have gotten the job. That one's weirder. I think she should have gotten the job. I think she should have gotten the job. I think she should have gotten the job. I think she should have got the job. I think she should have gotten the job. Notice how the accent puts each thing more questionable. In fact, we can notice it puts more possibilities sometimes, like the job as opposed to what? But we weren't considering the job with accent, again, so much we were in context, but it was more settled rather than open as opposed to something else when we put the accent there. It's not that accent always has to work that way, but it does in interesting ways. Where our focus of attention is, that would be where more certainties and uncertainties are. Why would we put our focus of attention where we are simply certain? Do you focus on the math problem you've already done? No. You focus on something that is determinate and indeterminate, like an unsolved math problem, not a solved one. I mean, why would you gaze that out to feel the bask of uh, the bask in the glory and warmth of truth itself? I don't. I think we move on. If you don't, you're going to run out of time, you know, on the exam. So the exam of life. So, with all of that, there is also the fallacy of figure of speech, which the nihilist also, misunderstanding a metaphor. Now, this one is for Lakoff and Johnson. Everyone actually uses metaphors all the time. Time goes in a line, places, spaces, all sorts of stuff. It's very difficult to talk, as Lakoff and Johnson say, about the self, time, 
feelings w that are not visual but very important things in our lives. Emotions aren't false and people aren't fake, but uh, as opposed to holo you know holograms or what have you. But the thing is, is that with all of this, um, uh, we definitely tend to use metaphors as far as this person's up or down or good or bad or something like that. And in certain ways that that's, uh... well, again, as always mentioned, it's like people have believed in the Big Bang and people have pointed out, though, it's not a bang if there's no media through which to hear the bang because in space, no one can hear you scream. Certainly not in a vacuum outside the bang. And, of course, everything coming from a single point has very serious problems with it, but it's a bit X and E, hello, kind of like Genesis. But you know what? Well, people are slowly shifting in their understandings is what. So people take metaphors quite literally. They don't know how to model otherwise until they model otherwise. Is actually a major lesson of philosophy and the history of thought. Try to find an example otherwise that has no metaphors in it and read carefully the words of the originator and author. You will often find people mocking people from using metaphorical speech, and then they certainly have embedded metaphors they are taking for granted. That now, if we're okay with the circle of life, the circle, you know, it's that lion cubs, etc., all of the animals at the watering hole, then we can take our metaphors literally and keep shifting around. But if you want final, literal answers, metaphor is a continuous circling problem. So that is the fallacy of the figure of speech. The Niaya example, I like the Niaya one very much. My cats are dancing. Must be a good lecture. The, uh, that with that, it says the sca the stands cry out. And I actually thought it was the scaffolding for like some sort of execution at first when I read the Niaya Sutra in the English uh, translation for myself. I'm not going to read it otherwise. And it turns out there are the stands that cheer for people, but the ch stands are cheering is what they say. And it's like, well, the stands can't cheer. And if somebody said that as a debate uh, partner, which it mentions in the commentary on the text that was composed over hundreds of years after that work, which was composed sometime around between like sometime 500, 300 BCE. That's the major Aristotelian debate manual, Gautama and the Nyaya School in India. Please look at my talks on that. There's a lot of astounding uh, coherence and similarities and all that. They say if somebody says the scaffolds cry out, they love the king. And he's like, the scaffolds can't cry out. They're made of wood. Then you would lose points of the debate if you are that kind of fool. Be very careful and be aware that you use metaphors all day long because how else are we going to describe invisible things like the self and time moving in a line or not? Yourself is kind of visible, not to you a lot of the time. Your mind, your dreams, not as visible like an object on a table. So... We tend to refer to things that we cannot touch as objects, and Lakoff and Johnson do point out in good ways, that creates a lot of interesting problems. But, we're people. We have problems, we have lives. So, if we did not have problems, what lives would we have, as the Taoists say? The fallacy of composition is wrongly attributing the property of a part to a greater whole. Again, property values in this state. For example, if water is wet and humans are three-fifths water, then humans are wet. Or, if San Francisco is progressive and liberal, then all of California is progressive and liberal. The uh, converse, the fallacy of division. These are very important, and in fact, like a lot of these, it is a judgment call as to how much somebody is or isn't doing this correctly. The fallacy of division is wrongly attributing the property of the greater whole to a particular part. The fallacy of composition, but in reverse. The whole of the part. For example... If water is wet and water has two hydrogen molecules, then hydrogen is itself wet. Or if San Francisco is progressive, then my conservative uncle who lives there must be very progressive. Uh, misattributing to hold apart. Now, plenty of times it is appropriate to, in context, think a part, a property of the part, is transferred to the whole and is there. Or there's a property of the whole, it is due to the pro property of the part. But sometimes it is not, and it is a mistake and quick reasoning. Quick and faulty reasoning. Biggity, biggity. No biggity, as in I won't say that word anymore. Bigotry and prejudice, I have to say those words unfortunately all the time. I am predisposed. They are types of fallacious, wrong composition and division. Racism, sexism, problems. This town, Berkeley, still has other people, may or may not. I don't know. Don't judge. 
Don't kink shame. If I say he's a Hindu and he's a jerk, so all Hindus are jerks, or if I, I have committed the fallacy of composition, judging the group by what is thought of the individual, likewise, if I say all atheists are immoral and she is an atheist, so she is immoral, that actually, it's funny that we don't notice necessarily, this is like or. We go through these motions and we don't notice necessarily which direction we're going, it feels it fits, as Wittgenstein would say. It feels odd, or it feels that things fit, or it feels now we can go on. All of these feelings are very important to how we think. I believe them to be combinations of basic feelings, and I'll talk more about that with Poe. But essentially, if we feel justified in making a judgment, sometimes we are overstating and overmaking a judgment. Yes, in error. And again, I happen to be very, well, I'm a big anti-racist, and then I'm a larger person. I have more square inches of whiteness, which gives me seniority over my fellow white people. And so with all of that, as I like to say, uh, it definitely seems that racism all over the place and prejudice of all kinds certainly is composition and division. Once, I, I actually back in the day tried to figure out if composition and division were the basic fallacies and if all others are made out of those. I didn't, wasn't able to work that out like that. So that, that utterly failed. There are several fallacies that mistake structure of the argument as a whole beyond mistaking the word or the statement. Now that actually itself is kind of composition because it's going from assuming outward. There is fallacy of irrelevant conclusion, missing the point, also somewhat known as red herring. I thought was, there's a very, people debate where the meaning of red herring comes from and I won't offer various explanations because all of them can be a little bit suspect, although I'm sure people know better than I the etymology. So, along with that, there is the fallacy of begging the question, which is similarly stating something questionable, but saying something that requires further evidence rather than stating something that isn't important. Begging the question is, well, we all know, you know, that Saturn is the best planet ever. It's like, why? That, that would be begging the question, because you are assuming something your audience may not. The fallacy of false cause is misunderstanding something prior as cause when it isn't. Such as thinking the moon causes people to go to sleep. I heard that example once. That is an excellent example. The, the moon rises, people go to sleep. A lot of people, uh, not the third and fourth shift types I've been meeting online occasionally, but the, uh, there's a lot of, you know, folks, but who are up late at night, you know, and that's the time they have. So the fallacy of false cause is when you think something that happens before something else is part of the cause, and it just happens to be coincidence. Uh, this is a good place to actually mention. Correlation, uh, there is the phrase, correlation is not causation. Not entirely. In a funny way, Causation is a type of correlation, and when one thing follows another, yes. But when causation, uh, all correlation is not causation. Some correlation is causation. When I start yawning and falling, nodding asleep, I go to, you know, and I have sleepy feelings, I go to sleep. Now that is correlation that happens to be very much causation. But in a certain sense, when the moon rises, that doesn't make me fall asleep. It, it's sort of in context, weirdly, a bit does, because I might get sleepy when I see the moon or it's night outside or those. But in another way, of course, what we understand from the example is I'm simply associating the moon as a early cause, and that is not the thing. And be careful, as I always mention, about thinking early pre-scientific societies made these errors, and then now we don't. I would much rather you understand we still have brains and still make all these mistakes with the latest technology, right? You know, or wrong. I'm wrong. Don't listen to me. Fallacy. The fallacy opposite that is affirming the consequent, assuming something prior is a cause when it isn't, but often is, which is somewhat different. Such as thinking that if drugs can make people crazy, then all crazy people must be on drugs. Sometimes, but again, this is unlike the moon because the moon isn't actually making people sleepy in, we're going to assume for our purposes. Drugs sometimes make people crazy, but that does not mean the drugs always cause insanity or insanity is always caused by drugs. Technically, we are talking about the latter um, more. Finally, uh, there is the fallacy of the multiple question. Asking a question that suggests things that, I, that either haven't been stated or aren't true, which is confusingly similar to begging the question. Also known as a leading question. This is more implying that it's like begging the question, but actually assuming that you can carry the way and that you're fooling people, I, I think. 
The famous unsavory example, and these are questions that are sort of begging the question themselves, which is also casting this, is ye old unpleasant example, my apologies about the jokes about abuse, you know, uh, that have you stopped beating your spouse and or kids? Let's not assume anyone's gender or pronouns. So obviously the classic example from back in the 50s day was more how uh, have you stopped beating your wife or, you know, as, the, the guy, as is the joke of the comedians at the time, guy, you know, pulls a Joker Batman set up, you know, and sticks up the couple and is like, your money or your life. And the guy's like, take my wife, please, which would be equivocation. He is mistaking if that is intentional, you know what I mean? But yes, is have you stopped beating your wife, sir? Well, of course, you're kind of screwed either way you go, right? Because if you say yes, then you stopped what was bad. If you say no, then you still do. And that obviously works with anything. Let's not just concentrate on spousal or child abuse. But with all of that and the media, etc., we have here that that's a loaded question. It's a multiple question in that it's a question that packs in other questions in there. It is like begging the question and or assuming things as such. There is a, uh, as a final joke, and I do love, uh, there are some brilliant moments of the old show The Critic, which was a comic, uh, it was a comedy cartoon for adults that was trying to compete with The Simpsons back in the day, and they had a couple of seasons. I own the DVDs somewhere around here, probably in here somewhere rather than out in the hall, and... I used to, there are a couple of jokes of that show that I mention all the time because they really had some brilliant one-liners and a couple of brilliant setups in that show. And uh, obviously hired a couple of amazing writers and folks. So there is a great moment where it's an episode where, where Jay Sherman, who is a TV critic, and he is in a high rise in New York. In New York, uh, in LA, all the studios are kind of on the ground floor uh, in the lot, etc. cetera. In, uh, in New York, people have studios in the side of uh, Fox News, et cetera, and all those folks are in the side of uh, skyscrapers. You know, they have studios in on like the 50th floor of these buildings. So he's up there and he's giving a show and uh, there is a fire and he passes out from the smoke, and his chain-smoking makeup lady, who's amazing, she comes in, she's like, what's going on in here? Because she's, she's like a chain-smoking, grizzled makeup lady person. She's got a great character. So she sees him on the floor. She picks him up. She's like a, seems to be an old, frail woman. She picks up Jay Sherman, and he's a very fat guy. She picks him up, slings him fireman style over her shoulder, fire people, and she walks down, if you've ever been to New York, she walks down all the flights of stairs, elevators out, she sets him down on the cor curb and she lights up a smoke immediately. She pulls out the pack, lights up a smoke as soon as she's out of the burning building. And as this happened, again, with uh, as a good example of loaded question, multiple question, one of my favorite jokes of all time, the re this good-looking reporter. And Jay Sherman is basically kind of a semi-intellectual struggling critic who hates, part of the show is he just hates bad TV and bad m movies and he gets to insult them all the time and be like, why, why this? And so this TV news reporter, who's clearly kind of an idiot, comes up and says, Jay Sherman, because he's a famous critic on TV in the, in the show. He says, Jay Sherman, isn't this entirely like the time when a mother lifted the Volkswagen off of her child? Except in this case, you are the Volkswagen, and the child is the child in all of us. And Jay Sherman looks at him just disgusted with this awful metaphor and just hack writing, and he's like, what the heck are you talking about? He doesn't say heck. And the guy says, I don't know. I was hired for my looks. And then he poses like newscast, you know, and it's like that's the end of the thing. It's, uh, it's again, except in this case, you were the Volkswagen and the child is the child in all of us. It's like that's such a wonderful multiple, multiple, multiple weird loaded question that is a really weirdly complex. Have you stopped kind of beating your spouse kind of question? And he's like, what the heck? And he just is upset, you know, beyond anything. And of course, he's not actually so upset that he's asking him. He's upset at the nature of how stupid this newscast is, you know, and uh, because he's a critic. Ain't we all? How about fallacies? In others, we don't make them, though, thankfully. And you don't. Following this. This broadcast, yes? All right. So much love, much happiness, little fallacies to you. Although if you make no fallacies, you are probably dead, you know, and not in error. Much love, much happiness, and I am going to follow up this. I have given, 
I have uh, the next talks for logic I need to do here, and I'm going to do them right now, is for Islamic thought and for Al-Farabi and Avicenna and others. So I am going to switch over to that here. Much love, much happiness. And please uh, watch my talks uh, in the past. Walk, well, please watch my talks in the future if I can talk. And I will see you if indeed I do ever see you.